the 69 years and 420 days since jujitsu has been invented, some things have gone down. From the very well known that even the most casual fan knows about, like Gordon Ryan is submitting Andre Galvo at ADCC, the most decorated champion in the promotion's history, to the less well known like this 150 pound Japanese guy using the power of heel hooks almost three decades ago to be a man twice his size in a true anything goes roll format. The Jiu Jitsu Iceberg, you know how it works, you start at the top, go to the bottom, and we're gonna be hitting every tier on our infinite descent down into madness as we delve deeper and deeper getting into the more obscure aspects of the sport. So buckle up, this is gonna be a bumpy ride. Before we crack into the video, gotta make something clear. A lot of things have gone down in jujitsu, and I can only fit so much knowledge into this bad boy right here. So if there is something you think that I missed, you're clearly wrong, because I've never made a mistake in my entire life, okay? All right, bad joke out of the way. Let's crack into the video. Layer one, or as I like to call it, the beauty layer, because it is surface level. We're gonna kick it off with our first entry, Gordon Ryan's outstanding performance at this year's ADCC. He had five matches against some of the best grapplers that the sport has to offer, and completely outclassed every single one of them, finishing four out of the five matches by submission. In a year where I think over half of the matches went the distance even into the overtime, which honestly is how most matches at the highest of levels play out. So the fact that Gordon was able to come in there and be so dominant, I don't think he got outplayed even once. Even the biggest Gordon Ryan hater has to admit that at least in Nogi, he is the greatest grappler of all time. This next entry is gonna be, um, interesting. So Mikey Misumichi, he's a five-time world champion. I imagine he's what a young Elon Musk would look like if Elon Musk was into jujitsu instead of taking over the world. Anyways, Mikey goes on to good old Joe Rogan's podcast and starts talking about how staying at a low weight and basically starving yourself is not fun. But a way that he counteracted that is only eating one time a day at night. And apparently his one meal a day is straight pizza. A bus day for much. And then the queen, yeah. I do not know what I am doing. And the fact that this blew up, I mean, it's the guy's diet. I mean, it just goes to show you that a lot of people who probably have really interesting lives and a lot of stuff going on are just really fascinated fascinated by what somebody that they don't even know eats. Good on you, internet. Now let's talk about Craig Jones. Yes, the OnlyFans sensation himself. He had a pretty great performance at this year's ADCC, coming up second place. Had a couple cool submissions. All good stuff. If you can even podium at ADCC, you're a f***ing stud. Now how do you think he did last ADCC? Well, I'll tell you. He got second place. And why do you think Craig Jones blew up in the first place? No, it wasn't his feet picks on OnlyFans, okay? His first big pop in the jujitsu scene was when he almost submitted Gordon Ryan at one of the EBIs. And guess what he placed? Number two. Now you must be thinking to yourself, man, guy keeps on getting second place. Well, that kind of sucks. However, and this is something I didn't know until a couple weeks ago. If you go to his Instagram page, guess what is in his bio? Second place at everything. Honestly, that is so funny. You really can't fault the guy. I mean, even his jujitsu team is called the B team. If my boy leans into the joke any harder, he's gonna end up falling. So this next one is something that everybody knows. It's the very famous jujitsu diet. I'm talking that Brazilian side. I'm talking those Mexican supplements. I'm talking that jamba juice. Whatever you want to call it. Everybody knows that anybody who is competing at the highest level in jujitsu, jitsu they're taking a little extra to, you know, help him out. I mean, just look at my man, Andre Galvo. My man's got delts on his delt. I don't know about you, but that don't look too natty daddy to me. And it's one of those things where if you want to be relevant, if everybody else is on something a little extra and you're not, you're kind of hurting your chances. And so it's one of those things where if you want to perform, you're pretty much forced into getting on a little cycle. A little bit of those trend and bologna sandwiches. In the words of a wise man, y'all motherfuckers are on steroids. Now that we have finished the truly most basic of levels, it is time to progress into something with slightly more depth. We're going to be stepping out of the kiddie pool and dipping our toes into something a little more of a waiting pool. At this level, most of the things that I'm gonna bring up, you should have at least some recollection unless you are literally just starting jujitsu today. And our first entry on this list is gonna be a good one. Let me set the stage for you. It's 2017. You have a super fight between Hodger Gracie, seven time world champion. I don't know why I'm holding up five fingers. Okay, it should be seven. And also one time Olympic jujitsu champion. Very impressive. In addition to competing at tournaments and being an absolute savage, 
savage at it, he also had fights with a winning record of 8 and 2. This was back in the day when you actually wanted to show that jujitsu was a viable way to defend yourself in one-on-one -on -one combat. His competitor, Marcus Almeida Buchecha. Going into this match, Buchecha had a ginormous amount of hype behind him. Coming into this as a seven-time world champion and two-time Olympic ADCC champion. When the two of them had met previously at Meta Morris, they won an entire 20-minute match, which ended in a draw. Not the most exciting stuff, but that's just what you get when you put two top-tier athletes up against each other. Going into this match, chances were high. That was going to be a 15-minute snooze fest. And for the first six minutes, not much happened in this match. However, Hodger shocked everyone. Going for this textbook close guard pull, Buchecha has one knee up the middle, a little bit of an awkward position, but Hodger uses that old school, basic-ass jujitsu to sweep him over, out of the scramble, takes his back, locks in a bow and arrow choke. This is literally stuff you learn on day one as a white belt. And submits one of the craziest grapplers who has ever graced the sport with his presence. This next entry is gonna hit a little close for me. Rafa Mendes was a huge inspiration back in my peak try-hard era because the guy was beating the best black belts in the world and making it look easy. I have submitted some of the best in the world. I have never been submitted. I have broken records. I have broken my own records. 2016, after winning not his fifth, but his sixth world title, he up and resigns. He's like, yo, I've done all the things that I want to do. I've got nothing to prove. And honestly, he really doesn't. My guy is on the Mount Rushmore of jiu-jitsu. Alpha Mendez, you do you, brother. Now this next entry is gonna be for all you guys that think your partner is a dirty roller. Because I guarantee it, they are put to shame by our boy, Paul Harris. Renowned as one of the notorious competitors of all time, who is known for for holding on to submissions until they break even after their opponent taps. Just look at that. Look at how many times him and the referee are trying to be like, yo, split it up, it is over. Super obvious why anybody in their right mind would be terrified of having a match with this guy. Juiced to the absolute gills and not only tries to win, but tries to break you. So enter our guy, Gary Tony. You may know him as Colonel Sanders. You may know him as the 1FC yada data up and comer. The guy who gave Gordon Ryan his black belt. The guy has done so much in Jiu-Jitsu, although one thing he has never done is win a black belt world title, which is why going into his match with Paul Harris, you would be forgiven for thinking that he's in a little over his head. But that is where you would be wrong, my friend. In their epic 20 minutes, no points, submission only match, he would go bar for bar, toe to toe, footlock for footlock, with the notorious ACL collector. As a fan of Gary Tone, I gotta say that this is one of the most impressive things that I have ever seen him do. Now this one's gonna be for all you 10th Planet bros who think that I hate on y'all. I actually don't. You just be saying some of the most sometimes, and you know, it's funny to meme on you a little now and then. Eddie Bravo versus Hoyler Gracie, number two. So this happened back in 2014. My gym actually went over a lot of 10th Planet stuff, you know, lockdown, grapevine, the zombie crackhead stoner, da 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 da. And so I was a white belt. I had been training maybe three months, and I could actually watch this match and be like, yo, that's lockdown. I, I know that move. This was a rematch of their match from, I think, 11 years ago at ADCC, where Hoyler actually got submitted by Eddie via triangle choke, huge upset. I would say if it wasn't for that, nobody would ever know who Eddie Bravo was, but let's be real, his friend is Joe Rogan. So going into this rematch a decade later, the stakes were pretty high. Obviously you got Hoyler, done incredible stuff in jiu-jitsu and fighting. Eddie, after that match, had actually gone on to build an entire new wave of jiu-jitsu. He had built a brand, he had built an empire, so he had a lot on the line as well. Now the match was a 20 minute, no points, submission only format. It ended in a draw, however, Eddie absolutely put it on Hoyler. Hoyler. Came close to submitting Hoyler a couple times, but all these funky moves that he had been preaching on, he was able to hit them live. He had actually put his money where his mouth was, and he had showed that, yes, they can actually be made to work, to the dismay and bewilderment of all the haters. Now, our next entry actually segues right off of our previous one, the Eddie Bravo Invitational. It is June 1st, 2014. Two weight divisions, 16-man bracket, single elimination, no points, no gi, submission only, plus overtime rounds. This was making jujitsu to great again. This new, exciting, sub-only format. This was something you watched. I know it sounds like I'm being a little sarcastic, but yeah, it was a brilliant innovation. And yes, it did bring a lot of entertainment value. Let's be real, Jiu-Jitsu kind of needs. If you actually want the athletes in Jiu-Jitsu to make enough money where they don't have to live in a freaking car. Now, regardless of how you feel about the Eddie Bravo Invitational, you cannot deny the cultural significance that it has had in Jiu-Jitsu. And even some pretty big names have come out of it. Obviously, you've got Gary Tonin, Craig Jones, and another smaller grappler you probably never heard of, Gordon Ryan. All right, now this next entry, if you don't know about it, I don't know what I can do about that. But you 
UFC 1. This was the first time that you saw a martial art that a small guy could use against athletic bros that are twice his size, which is why it absolutely blew up and introduced jujitsu as a viable martial art for the little guy, which at the end of the day is what the whole spirit of martial arts is. And it's one of the reasons why myself heard about jujitsu in the first place and wanted to do it. Did you know that back in the day, I made a video that was so good, YouTube would not let me post it. But fear not, for it is now on my Patreon, which I will link down below. For as little as the price of a coffee, you will receive access to an unreleased video by yours truly. Also, any proceeds that you send my way will be going to a good cause. The Pay For Jedi's Jacket Collection Fund, you would be doing the Lord's work. All right, enough chit chat. Let's get back to some more useless information. Now that we have left the realm of the truly casual layers, it is, it is time to delve into the truly abstract knowledge. Going forward, we are gonna be looking at things that you are only gonna know about if you have spent a while not only doing jujitsu, but immersing yourself in the culture. Let's delve into the unknown. Marcelo Garcia versus Rico Rodriguez, a true story of David versus Goliath. Now I know a lot of you that watch my channel are recently getting into jujitsu, and I do think you might not have a good idea of who Marcelo Garcia is, so allow me to reintroduce him to you. One of the greatest grapplers of all time by a long shot. Not only is he a five-time jujitsu world champion, he is a four-time jujitsu Olympic champion with the highest finishing percentage in history. For almost a decade, he went completely undefeated at his weight class. And as a smaller guy myself, it was always amazing watching him move up to the absolutes and still do pretty dang amazingly. Now his fight with Rico was at ADCC 2005 in the absolute division. Pretty quickly off the open, he takes Rico's back, but Rico plays his trap card. I thought slams were legal, but apparently they aren't. After Marcelo is able to recover, they get right back into the action, upon which Marcelo finishes the giant with a heel hook. And then goes on to say that heel hooks don't work. Kazushi Sakuraba, also known as the Gracie Hunter. Since Hoist Gracie smoked ass at UFC 1, the Gracies pretty much had a monopoly on martial arts and, above all, jujitsu. It wouldn't be long, though, before an up and comer would come through and use his combination of submission holds, wrestling, and anti-jujitsu to snatch away the title of best grapplers in mixed martial arts. Not only was he beating savages like a heavyweight Vitor Belfort, but in quick succession he was able to knock out Hoyler Gracie, Hoist Gracie, and capped it off by breaking Henzo Gracie's arm, which honestly kind of marked the beginning of a new era in which Gracie Jiu-Jitsu would no longer hold a monopoly in the world of combat fighting. Showing that it does come down to the athlete and not necessarily the discipline at the end of the day. Now for all you edge lords out there who think you're so cool because you'd be working your outside ushi honey hole emanari roll positions. I got news for you. There was a time that leg locks were seen as dirty and very not meta. No jujitsu competitor with any level of self respect was actually gonna put in any amount of time into learning leg locks. Ding Lister, who was a true pioneer, and in fact, it can be argued that Mr. John Danahar himself only started working on leg locks because of a comment that Ding Lister made. In pass. I'm gonna paraphrase this, but it goes something like, Yo, Dean, you're pretty good at leg locks. Why do you put so much time into it? Why would you ignore 50% of the human body, John? And that one comment made in passing by the boogeyman is single-handedly responsible for John Danahar making heel hooks as oppressive as they are today in the meta. Now, when it comes to the topic of greatest match of all time, without a doubt, one fight is always gonna come to mind. Gary Tonin and Kron Grace. Going into this, Kron was obviously the favorite to win the division. I mean, he's got Gracie in his last name. You can't get any more on the nose than that. Gary hadn't even competed at his first EBI. He was really an unknown quantity. And so the match starts off. Kron, as usual, winning tempo right off the open. Slaps Gary in a pretty tight arm bar. Has Gary's arm fully locked out, but Gary is doing everything not to tap. Pulling his elbow this, that. Eventually is able to pull himself out of a fully locked in arm bar attempt. I imagine Kron was probably a little tired because Gary instantly pounces, putting him in the truck, taking his back. All Gary has to do here is hang on for another minute and he is going to upset Kron freaking Grace. Kron's dad, Hicks and Gracie, absolute jujitsu legend. He's like, yo, son, you've got 30 seconds. Submit him. Boom, Kron gets out of the back, takes Gary's back, and with two seconds on the board, locks in a rear naked choke and gets the 
finish. And speaking of exciting Nogi matches, let's take a look at Marvin Castell's Eminari Roll to Heel Hook from Fight to Win number 16. This was one of those clips that if you had an Instagram or Facebook account back in 2016, you would have seen it at least 10 times every time you checked your phone. And if you just look at it, it's so obvious why it was blowing the frick up. Speaking of crazy submissions, let's go back to ADCC. This time it is 2015. We are in Sao Paulo, Brazil. It is the finals of the 77 kilogram division. Davi Hamos going up against Lucas Lepre, two bad mother -fuckers. Like I said before, when you get two guys of similar skill, you can have a boring match on your hands. However, if you turn your attention to this clip right here, not only a guard pass, but a guard pass to armbar with the finish. Bro, that is fucking insane. Let's go back to our boy Gordon Ryan. Now this is post EBI. He's done some stuff, but he hasn't established himself as one of the top of the top as we know him as today. He was coming off a decisive victory over Yuri Samos, a former ADCC champion. However, that was in a submission only points format, which not entirely the same. His next step in competition would be against Keenan Cornelius, the human dictionary himself. A black belt from Atos who trained with Andre Galvo on the daily. One of the top names in jiu-jitsu. No points, submission only, but also no time limit. He could be going on 12 hours. Don't worry, it didn't go that long. Just an hour and a half. Around the 90 minute mark, allegedly Keenan Cornelius was like, nobody got time for that. And gives Gordon Ryan this inverted heel hook. I think him and his girl had some date night planned or something. I, I don't know, allegedly. Now for this next entry, we're going back to ADCC. I'm starting to see a pattern here. On deck, we've got the craziest man in jiu-jitsu, Jeff Glover, going up against Gio Martinez. The two of them had actually competed at the first EBI, having a close match, which Gio Martinez would win in overtime. The match started off pretty typically. You get some basic exchanges. You got some funky shit going on too. However, the whole vibe would change when Jeff would get Gio in this fully locked in triangle in the ADCC rule format. You are allowed to slam your opponents. Yes, you heard me right. You are allowed to pick them up and slam them down on their head. Gio picks up Jeff all the way over his head and then drops him. Unsurprisingly, Jeff is completely out of it. Gio is able to pass his guard with no contest. Doesn't get the finish, but easily wins on points. And that is why when you go for a triangle, you gotta hook that near side leg. Now on this layer, we've got one more entry before we delve on into the next one. The first twister submission ever hit in a mixed martial arts fight. Enter our boy Chan Sun Jun, the Korean zombie known for coming forward, throwing hands. Not entirely known for his grappling. However, in his first UFC fight, fight after outpointing his opponent, clearly winning the first round, passes his guard, his opponent gives up his back, trying to scramble to his feet, but instead of looking for the choke, Korean zombie switches off to the far side, slaps his boy in the truck, gets over that arm, and cranks for that twister. Man, these 10th planet submissions kind of be looking cool. So this next layer we're gonna get into, it's a little, one second. Well. Now we have covered some ground, but we still have plenty further to go. On this next layer, we are gonna be covering topics that I highly doubt you have ever heard of before. This first one is gonna be a little bonus entry for y'all. I'm sure you have seen your fair share of fake white belt pranks. Alex Vamos, a jiu-jitsu black belt, pretends to be a white belt and crashes an advanced class, straight up trolling them, doing all the stereotypical newbie ass white belt stuff. This was the first one. When I watched this video back in the day, probably the thing that stuck out to me the most was seeing how the higher belts reacted to getting submitted by a white belt. It's almost like a kid finding out that Santa Claus is actually not real. Now they say that to be successful, you have to be a psychopath. And while I doubt the validity of this statement, our next entry may just prove me wrong. Now you all know Hicks and Gracie, I assume. While he may not be the most decorated jujitsu competitor of all time, what he was known for back in his day was being one of the baddest dudes on the planet, using his Gracie jujitsu back before anybody really knew how to deal with it effectively, except for Gracie Hunter, of course. His official record is 11 wins with zero losses. The say he would take would generally be open weight classes where he could be going up against somebody three times as big as him. And yeah, to have the cojones to do something like that, that's pretty legit. However, he is known for claiming that his actual record is 400 wins with zero losses. Now I've heard that this is actually in reference to his rounds, not only in professional fights, but also in practice with his training partners, which not exactly the same theme, but you know, you gotta think you're a bad dude to actually be a bad dude. So fair play to him. Our next entry will be all about what makes jujitsu great in the first place. No, not steroids. I'm talking about funky ass submission. It is 2007, Pride 
33. Our boy Nick Diaz is going up against Takanori Gomi, Fireball Kid. Living up to his name, Takanori Gomi would score a takedown, a knockdown, and pretty much dominate the first round. Going into the second round, Gomi would score a takedown, ending up in Diaz's closed guard where Diaz would hit this sick Gogo -go Plata submission. Not something you see every day. However, that would later be overturned into a no contest because apparently Diaz tested for Mary Jane. Oh yeah, by the way, this was Pride where you got juiced up dudes like Kevin Randall Man and Mark Kerr. So pop in a guy for a little bit of the good, good green. Yeah. Makes sense. Now let's take a second to revisit our boy, Marcelo Garcia. We're gonna rewind back to 2003 before anybody really knew what an absolute legend he was gonna become. After winning his first two matches in the bracket, he'd be facing the favorite to win that year, Victor Shaolin, who was an established name. However, he would shock everybody when he would hit this beautiful arm drag to the back, locking in a rear naked choke and choking out Victor Shaolin in under a minute and kicking off an absolutely dominant career. Now these days, BJ Penn may have a reputation as a retired UFC fighter who just can't stop getting into bar fights. But back in the day, in addition to being considered one of the greatest UFC fighters of all time, he also was a savage jiu-jitsu competitor. Not only did he receive his black belt within three years of training, but after only being a black belt for one month, he was able to win the world championship. Absolutely insane stuff. No wonder the kid was called the prodigy. And while we're on the topic of UFC fighters who also competed in jiu-jitsu, let us turn our attention to Jacare Sosa. Back before he would put his entire focus into being being a fighter. He was pretty serious in the competitive jiu-jitsu scene. In 2004, he got second place at Worlds in his bracket. When he would move up to the absolute weight in the finals, he would go up against an absolute legend, Hodger Gracie. Now he would outplay Hodger in the initial part of the match, giving him a point advantage that he needed to win the fight. However, after the halfway points, Hodger would slap him in this brutally tight armbar attempt. Most of the people when put in this position would just tap. However, Jacare was not most people. So instead of tapping to this armbar, he just lets his arm break. He just shoves his broken arm into his belt, finishing the match and winning on points. Position before submission, a saying older than time itself. I guarantee this is something your coach is telling you all the time. However, there are some exceptions where it is okay to give up position for a cheeky little submission. 2013 World Jiu-Jitsu Championship, you've got Clark Gracie coming off of the hot streak, going 4-0 at the Pan Americans, which is like a runner-up to Worlds. He will be facing Mahajataj, Gorilla Hands, that's what we'll call him. For Clark Gracie, it's business as usual. You get on top, pass their guard, and submit them, right? However, unbeknownst to him, his opponent had a secret weapon, as American as apple pie. He let Clark pass his guard to set up a sneaky little baseball bat choke. Not only letting Clark pass his guard, but fully take his back as he goes belly down, just cinching that noose tighter and tighter, and choking Clark Gracie unconscious. <laughs> My friends, we have made it to the deepest layer imaginable. The topics we're about to get into are beyond rare. We're gonna kick things off with a match that happened over half a century ago between Elio Gracie and Masahiko Komura. Yes, the guy who got a submission named after him. Gracie was claiming he was a national jiu-jitsu champion, while Komura was coming from the world of pro wrestling and judo, and also had a massive size advantage over Elio. Komura would score this hip toss to get on top, and from there, put Elio in this tight double wrist lock, cranking it until Elio's shoulder popped. However, Elio didn't tap because real men don't tap, I guess. However, it was rolled a technical submission win for Kimura, giving him the dub, and also getting a sick-ass submission named after him in the process. Now, we have already talked about the Gracie Hunter, who dismantled the Gracies as the number one grapplers in mixed martial arts. After defeating Hoyler, he would go on to face the icon of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, to Hoist Gracie, the champion of UFC 1. This fight would be scheduled for no time limit, just 15 minute rounds. After 90 minutes, yes, six of these 15 minute rounds, Hoist's corner decided that he had had enough and just threw in the towel, giving Gracie Hunter the win by corner stoppage. Now let's talk about a familiar face, Georges St. Pierre, one of the greatest UFC welterweights of all time. I imagine most of you do not know about this, but he actually competed at 86. CC won. won his first match on points, all good stuff. His next match would be against Leonardo Silva dos Santos. Really flows off the tongue. Now, George's game plan going into this was clearly get the takedown, win on points or submission. However, Leo had other things in mind. Going for a full send and jumping for a flying triangle off of the collar tie that he would finish to get the win. All right, guys, we have finally made it to the last 
entry on this beautiful iceberg. And boy, is it gonna be a good one. Let us rewind to April 20th, 1995. Yes, April 20th. I didn't make that up. We are in Japan for the Valley Tudo Open. Valley Tudo basically means anything goes. Now there are some exceptions. You cannot eye gouge and you cannot fish hook, but basically everything else goes. Enter Yuki Nakai, a Japanese jujitsu black belt, which would be something akin to catch wrestling today, standing five foot six and weighing a meager 154 pounds. In his second match, he would be pitted up against Gerard Gordeaux, I don't know, something French, a heavyweight kickboxer, standing a cool five foot six. Nakai's game plan going into this was clearly to use his grappling to get a favorable position and outplay his much bigger opponent, who not only had such a massive size advantage, but also decided he liked to eye gouge people, which Yuki Nakai would later come out to say made him lose his vision in one of his eyes, but he kept it a secret because he felt like if he came out and said that, it would completely shut down the sport of MMA in its infancy, and that's not something he wanted to happen. So he literally didn't even talk about losing an eye. He would go on to win this match by a heel hook. I don't care how far the sport has come, this is always gonna be unbelievably impressive. And finding out about this is a huge reason why I personally started training jujitsu in the first place. All right, different format. I know this video has been so long. Thank you for sticking around until the end. I will see you in the next one. Peace.